Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good afternoon, everyone. It is Tuesday, January the 9th, 2024. It is currently 4.51 p.m. Central Time, and I am coming to you live from the Theology Central studio located right here in Abilene, Texas. Now, I want you to imagine something, so you have to use your imagination. For some of you, that's very difficult. For some of you, you have to go, wait, how do I use my imagination? I forgot. All right, for some of us, that it's very easy. We can just... We can just slip into the world of imagination just like that. It doesn't take anything, all right? So I need you to do your best. Use your imagination. It's Sunday morning. You wake up. You take your shower. You start getting dressed. You go to the kitchen. Maybe it's coffee. Maybe it's donuts. Maybe it's eggs, bacon and toast. I don't know what your breakfast of choice is, but you eat your breakfast and then you're like, all right, family, all right, kids, honey, get to, get this, get that. And you get in the car and you drive to your local church. You walk into church, you greet everyone. Hey, how you doing? How you doing? Hey, everyone talks, everybody, small talk, everybody does that. Kids are running around. Hey, stop running in the church. Okay, all of that stuff. Okay, finally, finally, you sit down. Okay, you sing some songs and then the pastor walks to the pulpit. And he says, today, we begin a new series. And this series is a verse-by-verse exposition of, and you name the book. It could be the Gospel of John. It could be Matthew. It could be Leviticus. It could be Exodus. It could be where, and you're like, oh, this is so good. I'm going to learn the meaning of this book. I'm going to understand this book. And you're so excited. And, and, and everyone's always excited at the beginning of a series. Everyone's always excited. And you're like, great. And you're like, okay, I hope they really dig in. And they dig in. And maybe it's a, it's a church that really goes verse by verse. They really take it apart, right? And they, and then you start. And then you catch on really quick that you're going to be in said book, the book of Hebrews, gospel of John, whatever it may be, that you're going to be in the book, not just for a month, not just for two months, not just for three months, not just for six months, but maybe even multiple years. But even if your church does it in a much quicker pace, right? Six months, five months, whatever the case may be, maybe they really take you through it quick. When it's all said and done, and this is a real question. When it's all said and done, do you think you really know and remember what the book is about? Like, I don't know how many uh, sermon series you've been through in your church. If your church has gone through the Gospel of Matthew, if your church has gone through the book of John, whatever, I want you right now, if you can, I don't know which was the last one. Just think of the very last book your church worked through. I want you to stop right now, grab a piece of paper, And I want you to think of the chapter, whatever chapter, Romans 1, whatever it is, Matthew 1, Matthew 5. Even if you haven't heard all of the sermons in the series, just think about the sermons you've heard in the series. And I want you to tell me, and I want you to write on paper. I really want you to do this. What was he, gave me the basic idea, the basic understanding of each chapter. Summarize the main point of each chapter. Go, just go ahead and start. Matthew 1 go. What's the main idea? What's the basic concept? Matthew chapter 2, Matthew chapter 3, Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 5. Oh, we know where we're getting to in Matthew chapter 5, right? Okay. Matthew chapter 6. We know where we still are. Matthew 7. We know where we're concluding, right? Can you do that? Now, if now just think about it. And, and this is a very important question. When you finish that sermon series, from your church, and you get to the end of it, and you can't even remember the basic idea of each chapter, what then did you accomplish? What's even worse is sometimes you'll get to the end of the book, and people won't even really remember the main idea, the main concept of the book. And here's the reason why what happens. Right, the Bi- It's amazing that we have Bibles that are broken down into chapter divisions. It is awesome. But within those chapter divisions, there's these verse divisions. And so when a pastor starts preaching, 
Now, if he goes quick, he may do a summary of the chapter, but if, even if he's doing a summary of the chapter, you know at some point he's going to emphasize one verse. He's going to emphasize maybe a couple of verses. And what happens is since we go, and even if we, and especially if the church goes through it verse by verse, by the time you finish a chapter, you've heard 10, 15, 20, 30, maybe it may feel like you've heard 40 ideas. And maybe they'll try to all group those ideas to the over, overarching point of the chapter, but sometimes something gets so lost in all of it, right? I think the intentions are good. I think the motives are good. I think even the effort sometimes is good, but when it's all over, I think a lot of people walk away going, okay, well, I mean, John was about this, but I mean, John 1 was about this, but then it was also about this because you, because the passage gets broken down for individual sermons. I, want, I, I cannot stress this enough. I want you to hear me. When the Bible gets broken down into sermons, typically the thing that is lost is the actual meaning of the text. I know you're going to argue with me, but it's true because you have to preach a sermon. And when you start preaching a sermon, what do you think? Okay. I need an introduction. All right, good. I need some illustrations. Good. All right. I need to make, I have, I have to have two, three, four points. I need an outline. Okay, good. I need supporting evidence. Great. Oh, and to interpret this, we're going to have to do cross-referencing, so we're going to have our cross-references. So when you take an average sermon, you've got introduction, you've got conclusion, right? You're going to have illustrations thrown in and personal stories, right? You're going to have your outline, three or four points. You're going to have your cross-referencing. Well, you see, and, and, that, and so what you're going to remember is may, you may remember the point of the sermon, you may remember the sermon and that sermon is going to emphasize something specific that that sermon is going to have something it's trying to convince you of something it's trying to prove it's going to have a it's going to have a desire to try to convict you and what you're going to do in many cases is you're going to walk away remembering the sermon but not the text you're going to be able to tell me what the sermon was you're going to say oh in John chapter 1 we learn this and, but is that really the meaning of the text or was that the meaning of the sermon did you really grasp the text or you just heard a lot of sermons? See, sometimes the sermon literally gets in way of the text. And the verses, we get so caught up in the individual parts of the verses that sometimes we remove that from the chapter. So then I'll, let me ask you the question, how can, what can you do? as a Christian, to simply try not to have a sermon, not to try to have a devotional, because everything we do is very practical in its nature. Devotionals, it's about giving you a point, right? When you're done with a devotion in the morning, you typically remember the point of the devotion. You don't really remember the point of the text. You remember the application and illustrations of sermons more than you actually sometimes remember what the ser what the sermon was really exegeting or the text it was exegeting. Oh, I mean, and then whenever you talk about the passage, what you typically do is you parrot the sermon that you heard, if you even remember the sermon. How much of what the church does actually keeps people away from the text? Now, it would be a fascinating exercise and a fascinating series to do where we're like, we are going to start a journey through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and all we're going to do is try to figure out what is the main point of the chapter. What is the main point of the chapter? Not all of the individual parts, not breaking it down, not trying to create a sermon, not trying to have a three-point outline. What is the, if we were to reduce the chapter down to its one main point, now maybe the chapter doesn't have one main point. Maybe it actually has two or three. Maybe the chapter itself should be broken down into an outline. Maybe it, it should, but what you want to do is try to figure out what is that chapter saying? Not what it means, not what, not, not trying to interpret it, just what is it trying to say? You're not trying to see if it agrees with your team, disagrees with your team, supports your theology, disproves your theology. What does the text say? I think so much of what we do as Christians actually keeps us away from the text. It almost builds a wall, right? It builds a wall and it keeps us away from the text. The sermon becomes the wall. 
The Bible study, the devotional becomes a wall keeping you literally from the text. Do you truly understand the text? And then when Christians start talking, you sometimes hear it and they're fighting and arguing. And it's like, I don't think he, I don't think sometimes when you listen to Christians argue, I just kind of want to step in the middle and go, I think the problem is neither one of you are actually studying or actually looking at the text. You're parroting what's been said about the text. You're parroting commentaries and sermons. What does the text actually say? Now, why have I spent 10 minutes laying down this foundation for this episode? Well, because about five minutes ago, I saw an article. The article is entitled, How Do I Find the Main Point of a Psalm? And I'm like, oh, wow. That's a good question. And, but I, now I didn't read the article. I, I did find, realize that the article had audio. So I went and found the audio and downloaded the audio. I have not listened to the audio. So I have no idea what direction they're going to go. So this may, I may prove to be very foolish in trying to put this episode together, but it just got me thinking, what can I do to help people grasp the meaning of a chapter. What can I do? What is the main point of a psalm? What is the main point of Genesis 7? What is the main point of the text? Now, pastors look at it, and even if they, they may try to remind people of the main point, they may even try to emphasize it in their sermon. But when you start breaking the text down, and you're trying to give points of application, and you're giving illustrations, and you've got your opening, you know, your introduction, and then your dramatic conclusion, and people are going to walk away, and they're going to remember the sermon more than they're going to remember the text. It's inevitable. It's a disease. And I know nobody wants to address that, but it just happens. Sometimes people remember the sermon. They don't remember the text. So I started thinking, have I done a sufficient job in trying to help people do that? Now, the best thing I've ever come up with in trying to help people is the chapter summary method. And I didn't come up with it, but I learned the chapter summary method. What, 1980? I don't even remember the year. And I've been teaching the chapter summary method to people Anywhere and everywhere I I can. I've tried to teach everyone, use the chapter summary method. Use the chapter summary method. I try to give people ideas. If you're doing a devotional and you see whatever the text is for the devotional, before you read the devotional, stop and do a chapter summary method. If you get ready to listen to a sermon and you realize that they're going to study a text before you listen to the sermon, stop and do a chapter summary method. No, I know that's not practical, but I've tried to emphasize it that much. And I've tried my best, even as a pastor, to say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. You want to argue with me? You want to disagree with me? Well, okay, so you're going to disagree with me on that? Have you done a chapter summary method on this? Now, time and time again, they don't actually do the chapter summary method. They just want to argue. And then when you listen to the argument, you're like, I have Google as well. I can Google the same thing and find the same articles that you're parroting back to me. Actually, would you would, would you actually do the study? Okay. Sometimes when people want to argue with you, even sometimes when people send emails to me, I'm like, I, I, I can just take part of an email, do a Google search. And I'm like, and you got that from page 82 of MacArthur's commentary. Do you want to actually study the text or what do you want to do? Okay. All right. So I think we're going to listen to this. We're going to analyze it. It's only 11 minutes. So it's short. And we're going to see what they suggest. We're going to see what they suggest. Because they want else to help us. How do we find a main point of a psalm? I'm going to take it beyond the psalms and just, how do you find the main point of a chapter in the Bible? What What is your method? If you're, if you're, so I gave you the illustration of going to church, right? So let's say you went to church. Let's say your kids, instead of off running around playing games or whatever they do in church, let's say it's a church where the kids actually, you know, sit and listen to sermons, right? I know that's a weird concept. I know, I know. They got to be off having fun, food, and okay. All right. But they actually listen to a sermon. And maybe it's a church that actually encourages kids, I don't know, to take sermon notes. Okay. All right. I know. Crazy concepts, crazy concepts. But let's say you get in the car and your kid says, hey, The pastor was preaching from Matthew chapter 12 today. And you're like, very good. That's all right. You you say, very good. You're like, we're going to stop wherever you want to get food today. All right. Awesome. Thank you for paying attention. And they're like, well, mother, father, I would like for you to summarize to me. What is the main point of Matthew chapter 12? Now, first, you'd probably be like, what happened to my child? Where is my child at? And you'd probably turn around, drive back to the church and see if you can find your kid, because clearly your kid has been replaced by someone else. But I get the idea. 
But you, what would you say? Now, you just listened to an entire sermon from Matthew 12. Would you be able to summarize the point of the text, not of the sermon? Or would you simply start reciting sermon points? And if, if the child was like, well, since you don't know, can you help me figure out what the main point is? Would you know how to sit down and say, okay, well, let's open our Bibles and figure it out. What are the steps you take to understand the main point of a chapter, of the chapter, not of a commentary, not, not of the individual verses, but you take it all together. Here is the main point of this chapter. And do you think we can do that in a regular, what do you think would happen if all Christians learned the skill and before of arguing about verses and arguing about things, we all could agree on what the main point of a chapter is? Now, I think for some people, they don't care about the main point of the chapter. They care about individual verses to prove or to proof text their their theological team. But I don't know which direction they're going to go. So let's listen. And maybe we maybe we just say, well, they didn't help us. (laughs) This may turn into going, that was a waste. And maybe we will have to figure out exactly how do we understand the main point of a chapter or the main point of a psalm or a main point of anything. Proverbs would be very difficult. I, I, let's, okay, we can, obviously, genre of literature has a major impact on you being able to understand the main point of a chapter, right? Proverbs could be very difficult. Sometimes Proverbs aren't. The whole chapter seems to have one primary theme, but it may just use individual Proverbs to get you there, but you, you get the idea. All right. Let's see if we can, let's see what they say. Here we go. How do I decode the point of a whole chapter of the Bible? Like, how do I summarize the main point of a whole psalm? Welcome back to the podcast. That's the question we need answered today. And it- okay, so how do we decode the meaning of a chapter, of a whole chapter? How do we understand the main point of a psalm? That is the question. And that's what they're going to attempt to answer for us. If you're reading your Bible along with us using the the Navigator's Bible reading plan, uh, our reading schedule hits January 8th today, and that means we're reading Psalm 8 together. Psalm 8 is a rather hard text to make sense of, hard to summarize. So it's a good time in our Bible reading to pause and ask Pastor John how he summarizes this and other whole chapters uh, in whole Psalms. Philip asks the question. It's a very good one. Pastor John, I have really enjoyed the way that you go through individual verses and explain them very clearly by breaking them down and explaining each part. I understand that meditating on small parts of Scripture can help us really suck all the nourishment from it. But sometimes my problem is in understanding entire chapters or larger sections of the Bible. I read something like Psalm 8, and although I can understand small parts of these texts, I really get lost and fail to follow the entire flow of an argument or of where a chapter is going. I'm often confused by a whole psalm that seems disjointed to me too and can't follow how one line leads to the next. Could you help me figure out ways to understand large sections of scripture as a whole rather than just small chunks disconnected from other parts? Thank you. All right, that's a great question. That's an amazing question. All right. I love that. I love that. That's just, that's a great question. But I, and I, I just want to say this. I think inevitably, it, it, the reason so many people in the pew would have problems doing this, it's the result of sermons. And I know I'm going to get, uh, preachers would disagree with me. Like, no, I preach a sermon and I help them understand the text. You preach sermons. You've got an introduction. You've got a body. And even though you may be trying to put it all together, it inevitably becomes like, so this was the three points in the sermon. Forget the three points in the sermon. What was the text about? Here was the application. Forget the stinking application. What was the text about? And a lot of times when you ask someone what the text about, they simply recite a sermon. So can we develop skills that allows us to take a text and go, this is what the main point was. This is the key element. This is the key focus. This is the key of the narrative of this entire chapter or section of scripture. Now, I don't know what Pastor John, now the Pastor John they're going to ask here is obviously John Piper. Um, and so we're going to hear what John Piper has to say and what his suggestion is. Here we go. Let me see if I can help 
first with an analogy, uh, namely an analogy of a jigsaw puzzle, and then with an exhortation about the hard work of seeing a whole chapter whole, and then give an example from my own experience. Think of um, a larger unit of scripture, like a, a chapter or a few paragraphs or maybe several chapters. Think of it as um, a, a jigsaw puzzle, a 500 piece jigsaw puzzle. For me, this is just like the way I go about it. They're five. Now, I like this. I think there's a level of truth to that because you take a chapter, you've got all these verses, and these verses become pieces of a puzzle. So many times that we take the individual pieces, and that's our devotional thought. We take the individual piece. That's our sermon. Look, I do it. We all do it. It's just it's the, because the Bible's broken down into verses, right? So you're going to grab three or four. And, 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 and so we do this over and over and over and over and over. In fact, today, for our, my, the sermon that I reviewed today for the Sermons 2.0 app challenge, it was all in James 4, 1 and following. He immediately was breaking that down. He didn't even, in that sermon, we never got what the chapter was about. He just like, here's the verses that we have in front of us. And then even that was a little bit confusing because he was telling us where he's going to give us the cause of carnality when in reality he was giving us the result of carnality, which got a little bit confusing. But he never said, James 4, here's what the chapter is about. And here's how these individual pieces put together end up with what the chapter is about. Now, I, I sometimes fail to do that because sometimes in your preaching, you're wanting to exhort, you're wanting to rebuke, you're wanting to correct, you're wanting to, you've got a specific purpose. And, and, and I'm not saying those purposes are ever wrong, but because of we have so much preaching and teaching that we constantly have a tendency to take the section, but we miss the chapter. So the pieces are great. But we love to take the pieces and then take, I'm going to take this piece, this piece, this. I'm going to take five pieces and I'm going to walk over here and make a sermon. Yeah, but when the sermon is done, you've created a full picture. But guess what? It's a picture probably not of what the chapter is actually about. 500 pieces laid in front of you. And as you look at them, they do not look at all like the painting on the front of the box. They, they are just one big jumble. And that's how the words and phrases and clauses might look to you in a chapter in the Bible when you... Now, I agree. We get those pieces. Now, here's where I think we mess up. Well, a lot of times what we do is we look at the pieces we're like, okay, what is this chapter about? And we immediately go, we look for the picture on the box. Now, in this case... The picture on the box is not what the chapter is actually about. The picture on the box for many Christians is the sermons they hear or a commentary or study Bible notes. Well, you're, you, you're, you're someone else just painted the picture. You don't know if that's the actual picture of those pieces put together. You, someone told you this is the picture. It's your job to take the pieces and put them together. And then you see, see, in a puzzle, you have the picture in front of you, right? And then you just start trying to put the pieces together because you've already got the picture. You already kind of know what you're going for. No, no, no. In Bible, you don't know the picture. The thing is, any picture that someone told you is what the chapter is about, you need to forget it immediately. You've just got the pieces and you don't know what the picture is. You don't know what it is. Your job is to put it together to see what the picture is. And the picture is not of those individual verses or not the picture of a sermon, but to put those pieces together to get the picture of the chapter itself. You try to think of the chapter as a whole. It just lots and lots of words and phrases and clauses that might say some nice things, but my, oh my, they don't make one big picture. How do you go about seeing the whole picture instead of 500 scattered pieces? And of course, the Bible doesn't have a picture on the top of the box. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're working a little harder here. How do you see a chapter as a whole with a, a main point, with all the pieces fitting together to make that main point, instead of just seeing 60 or 70 scattered clauses and phrases? That's, that's the goal. You take one piece. Right. This is the way I love. I love do puzzles like this because I love figuring this out. 
you take one of the pieces and you look at the piece very carefully. You don't just keep scanning your eyes over 500 pieces superficially. Oh, let me see something. Oh, let me see something. No, 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 no. You get nowhere that way. You take one piece and you examine it very carefully. And you notice that half of this piece is solid red and the other half is uh, gold, solid gold. And you notice that the little protrusion at the top is split in half and half of it is gold and half of it is red. And from this, you infer with careful thinking that there is another piece somewhere here, somewhere that will be half red and half gold. And instead of a protrusion, there's going to be an indention in the bottom of the piece leading up into half red and half gold. And now you're looking very specifically for that piece. And you scan the 500 pieces this time looking specifically for that. And you find maybe six or seven or eight pieces that have this half red, half gold. And you slide them around looking for how they can fit together. You push them off to the side of the table in a corner and you find one or two that fit and then another and another. And pretty soon you realize that you've got five, six, seven, eight pieces all fitting together. And you notice, oh my, this is a robe draped over the arm of a throne. So that's going to go here, probably. You set that, that mid-size unit aside. Okay, now I know he's giving an illustration. He'll, he'll explain the illustration in a minute. So what he's saying is when we open our Bible, we've got all the pu- pieces of the puzzle of a chapter right? We got all these phrases and then we look at one and we look at it and we look at it and we look at the one verse, one verse over and 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 over. Then we go to the next verse and then we see how over, as we start going from verse to verse to verse, we start seeing how this fits together with this. And then by the time we're done, dun, 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 we have the completed puzzle. Now that sounds great. That sounds wonderful. But here's what we have a tendency to do because we're trained to do this as Christians. Look, no matter what you say, you're trained to do this. What, do, do I have in front of me? Hang on. I'm, I'm, hang on. Just stay with me here. Oh, here's one. All right. Do you hear this? This happens to be laying on the floor because I have these things laying everywhere. This is from fall 2022. I know it's 2024. This is fall 2022. This is a devotional called Stand Firm, God's Challenge for Today's Man. And I'm a man, so I needed a man devotional. Okay, I guess, I don't know. I laugh sometimes how we market devotionals to women, to men. To, I don't, can we just, it's just a devotional. It's applicable to everyone, but I, okay, whatever. So you open it up and the first one is Leviticus 5, 1 through 5. And then underneath that is, if someone incurs guilt in one of these cases, he is to confess he has committed that sin. Confess your sins, don't bury them. And it opens with an illustration. I guess when I'm done with this, I am going to take Leviticus 5, 1 through 5, and I'm going to, and this devotional is going to be about confession. I am looking at one piece and it's never going to be put together to get me to the picture on the box or to create a picture on the box. It's going to take that one piece and then that one piece becomes my devotional. It becomes my quiet time or it becomes my sermon, right? For example, someone could take Psalm 8. Oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Who has set thy glory above the heavens? Now, I could start with Lord. Well, the first one is capitalized, L-O-R-D. Hmm. And the second one is uh, not a capital L, but then smaller, lowercase O-R-D. Now, immediately, I could start working on why. what is the meaning of Lord, all caps, what is the meaning of Lord, only capital L? And then how excellent is thy name above all the earth? What, how is his name excellent above all the earth? What is it about his name? Which name is it referring to? The capital L-O-R-D or the uh, capital L lowercase O-R-D? Now immediately, and this is what happens in preaching, even ver- uh, 
churches that are very verse by verse. So you start breaking that down. Now I'm taking the piece. I'm breaking the piece down even into smaller pieces. It's all good. It's all great. It's all amazing. There's nothing wrong with this. You got to hear me. But what's going to happen is you're never going. I, I, by the time you're done with the chapter, I don't know if you're going to know what the chapter was about or the main point. You're going to know all of these wonderful truths about, oh, that Lord is different from that Lord. And how excellent is that name? Which name? Who has set thy glory above the heavens? He has, his glory is above the heavens. Okay, how do we understand that? Verse 2. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. So what does it mean, out of the babes and sucklings? And, and how does he do, how, how does this work? So now we're breaking the piece down into smaller pieces. The only thing by looking at each individual piece, we are trained to take that individual piece and turn it into a devotional thought, a, a sermon, a lesson, an application. And so by the time we're done, we may have started with 30 pieces. We'll end up with 700 pieces, all in almost like individual messages and sermons together. So when it's done, the pastor may say, well, and the overall message of the chapter is this, but sometimes we won't know the overall message. We remember the individual messages, the individual devotionals, the individual sermons. So he's saying now we've got to look at each piece and then finally see how they start fitting together. That's great. In theory, in theory, that's great. I don't know how that works practically. Because even if I was sitting down, like I'm going to study Psalm 8 tonight, right? If I was going to say this evening, I'm going to spend the evening in Psalm 8, guess what I would immediately start working? I just showed you what I would immediately start working on. There, it, it would be very easy for me to forget the chapter and start going, wait, Lord, that's all capital as that. Jehovah, Jehovah, Yahweh, like, okay, what, what, Lord, is that Adonai? Because it's only the capital L. Like, okay, and what is the difference between the two? And then what does it mean? How excellent is thy name? Is that his name just in general or all the names combined? Like, what does that mean? And what, and like, I, I, I could, I, and next thing you know, I'd probably be turning on the microphone going tonight. We're going to talk about Psalm chapter eight, verse one. You've heard me do that. I'm just, I do the same thing because that's what we do as Christians. I'm not saying it's inherently wrong. What I'm saying is at some point, we do need to be able to figure out what is the main point of the chapter. So at this point, he wants us to look at the individual pieces, keep moving them around until they fit together. All right. That sounds good. Let's see if he gets more specific and practical on how this is done now, and you do the same thing all over again with another piece with its peculiar characteristics, fitting the pieces together as you go. So that's how you build little pieces into mid-sized units. We might call those two or three verses or a paragraph, and we've got maybe five paragraphs are going to fit together, but that's, now you're, now you've got several, maybe three, four, five, six, seven, eight mid-sized units, and you should be able to discern of those three, four, five verses in each unit, what's the main point there because of how they fit together. Now, here's my, here's my exhortation. One of the reasons we don't move from the part to the whole in reading the Bible is because it is very hard work. It is hard work to fit all the mid-sized pieces together so as to see the whole. For most of Now, I know I'm interrupting him there. He's, he's about to say for most of us. I'm just going to start. I'm just going to state it. I disagree with his approach. I know, shocker, right? My hermeneutical approach would be different. I would say, no, 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 no. You want to know the main part of a chapter? This is what I would immediately say. I, would, I don't go with vague principles. See, the difference with me when it comes to Bible study, most of the sermon series that I hear about Bible study, they drive me crazy because they don't give you, they, they're they acting like they're giving you some specific plan. And it's like, read, highlight, cross-reference. Like, like they give you the most vague principles in the world. I'm like, that's not a bias. No, <laughs> I just want to yell. I, I, look right here. If you want to know the main point of a chapter, you need the chapter summary method. I'm just, I'm just going to be dogmatic about it. I, I'm not going to back down on that. Looking at the individual pieces, you're, no, 
What I will say is the first thing you need to do is you take a chapter and this is what you do. I'll just start with the basic steps of a chapter summary method. You read the chapter five times in one setting, if all possible, and one of those times is out loud. You don't consider notes. You don't consider individual verses. You don't try to interpret anything. All you're doing is re- doing an observational reading five times in a row and one of them out loud. Now, why? Because if you do it that many times, you're going to start getting a basic idea. I think I know what this chapter is about. Okay, I think I I see how it fits together. You're going to start seeing. The more you read, the more you see. Not by staring at the individual piece. You're going to stare at the whole. And the way you stare at the whole is just reading it over and over and over and over and over. No notes, not even trying to interpret anything. Now, after you've done that, you then give the chapter a title. Now, sometimes you can't do this until the end, but you give it a caption, a title. Because, and guess what? That title is to summarize what the chapter is about. So we're not looking at the individual pieces. We're looking at the whole. Then after you've done that, then guess what you do? Now you list the contents in the chapter. You're not trying to interpret it. You're not trying to understand it. You're just writing out, okay, this chapter has, these four verses has this, these four verses has this. Now you're putting your group, now you're grouping the contents down. You're putting the, you're grouping these pieces of the puzzle together in some form of an outline. You're grouping it together and you're getting the contents down. You're not in, in, you're not getting so preoccupied with the individual piece. You're like, okay, I've got all of these pieces. Now I've, I've looked at this enough. I think this is basically what it's trying to say. So now you have, yeah, now you're going to take the pieces and try to group them together. So you've got your title or your caption. You've got the contents. Now you look at the chapter. Are there any people mentioned here? And you just write them down the chief people. You don't try to understand anything about them. You just like, I think these are the key people in the chapter. Then you're, then since you've read it five times, you've broken the contents down, you've given it a title, you see the key people. Is there a key verse? Do you think there's one verse that summarizes everything the chapter is about? Do you think this is the verse that hinges, that the whole chapter hinges on? Then key words, you write down, are there words that are repeated multiple times? Or, or maybe it's a word that's only, only used once. You've read the chapter five times, you're going to have a pretty good idea going, I think these are the key words in the chapter, Right. Then you're going to write down the challenges, the things you don't understand, but you don't, you don't go study it. You just write it down. Then you think of any cross references, any cross references that may help, help you understand the chapter, not the individual piece, but the chapter, right? Then you write down the central lessons from the chapter, but I would, I, we could modify this. This is where then you write down, what is the chapter about? Now, those are specific steps. What is the chapter about? Our sermons focus on the individual piece. He's saying focus on the individual piece. Now he says it's very hard to put it all together. Well, because we're trained not to put it together because of sermons. Now he's going to say we're, he's getting ready to say something we sometimes do. Let's go back to it really quick. Of us, I certainly include myself here. We simply cannot do this in our head. Yes. And there's where people run into trouble. They're reading devotions and they're they're trying to do this in their head. Well, I can't even begin to do this in my head. Okay, now number 1, I agree. Now, the problem is he didn't realize he didn't he he needs to acknowledge devotions are the problem because they break everything down to the individual pieces. They don't try to put them together. I just gave you an example from the devotional I have here. It's Leviticus 5. It's not going to help me understand the chapter. It wants me to deal with the subject of confession. Well, that's great. That's wonderful. I can get something from that day. I can get some spiritual food, but it's not going to help me in understanding the chapter. Now, I agree. It requires paper. That's why I just gave you the chapter summary method. And what do I constantly say? If you're not writing, if you don't have a pencil and a notebook, you're not studying. And people get offended when I say that. Usually it's Christian men. They get offended. I'm like, look, if you're not going to, if you're not going to sit down and do actual Bible study, meaning work on paper, then you're not studying the Bible. Look, stop whining about it. You're the one who who wants to be a Christian and our revelation happens to be in written form. Okay, That's not my fault. Okay, go find a religion where the, 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 the stuff is not in a written form. It's it has words. 
And the only way you're going to break those words down is by working on paper and writing this. And, and that's where the, I've given you the steps, though. He's he's like, you know, you can't just do this in your head, but you got to give me the steps that I'm supposed to be doing on paper. Well, I'm giving you the steps. Right now, some of it, you don't need to write anything down, which is reading it five times. You've got, you've got to read the chapter at a minimum of five times. I would dare say some chapters require 10. And of course, then two of those would be out loud. And the reason you read it out loud is because, well, just try it. You'll see. All of a sudden, the whole chapter sounds different when you hear yourself saying the words. We have to do it on paper. We have to write it down. We have to jot down the main point. The red and gold mid-size unit means robe over uh, the arm of a throne, that kind of a thing. And and then we jot down the next main point of the next mid-size unit and so on until we've got it on our piece of paper, six, seven, eight sentences, which now each one sums up the mid-size unit in the chapter, in the larger unit we're trying to understand. And then we try to go about seeing how those mid-size units relate to each other. And my exhortation is simply, don't give up on that. Mm. Use a pencil and a paper, draw lines between them. You just have no idea how they might all fit together. You'll be amazed at what you're able to see by trying to fit those mid-size units and their main point together to make the, the larger piece. Now, I've been baffled over the years by the main point of Psalm 8. It seems like the main point is, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, because it begins with that and it ends with that. And that's a wonderful structural thing to see. But in the middle, you got this babies who cry out and God gets victory over his foes through the mouth of infants. And so I, I jotted that down. Okay, so the meaning of the first part of the psalm, just the first couple of verses, seems to be God gets victory over his foes by babies saying things. And I have no idea how that works. None. That's just what it says. So I I jotted that down. And then the next unit, which seems just totally different, I behold your heavens and the thing, your handiwork, and what is man that you're mindful of him? And through this man who's just a little lower than the heavenly beings, you govern the whole world with fish and birds. And, and I said, and I, and I tried, now what's the main point? I want to, I've put a few pieces together here. I want to jot down on my piece of paper the main point of this mid-size unit. And I jotted down, God exercises dominion over his earth through insignificant man who compared to the stars seems like nothing. And as soon as I wrote it, I saw, oh, I get it. The babies are insignificant, and God works his victories through babies, and man is insignificant, and God exercises dominion through man, and then he ends it. How great is his glory and his majesty. Surely then, the point is, one of the peculiar aspects of the majesty and glory of God is that he gets his victories and he exercises his dominion through the use of weak and insignificant things. Amen, amen. Praise God. And that's exactly the use that Jesus makes of it, or that Matthew makes of it, as Jesus enters the uh, city on Palm Sunday where the babies are crying out, Hosanna, and he's, and he's on a donkey of all things. So... The point is, look at the pieces very carefully, fit them together in mid-size units, jot down the main points of the mid-size units until you have them all on a, on a half sheet of paper, and then think and think and pray and pray and think and pray and think and pray and organize and draw lines and try to fit them all together until they fall into place and you see how these five, six, seven, eight, nine points of the mid-size units are in a flow that make one big overarching point. And you will be surprised if you take up pencil and paper and uh, do this, what you will see. Mm. That's a great encouragement for us to piece things together on on paper as we read our Bibles. And uh, thank you for this summary of Psalm 8, Pastor John. Time. Okay, now. 
You heard his approach. My approach is radically to, I say, start with the whole. Start with the chapter. There's the chapter, Psalm 8. Read it five, six, seven times. Just read it. Just read it. Just read it. And then after you've read it, try to give it a title. Try to give it a title. You may have to change your mind later, but give it a title. Then you start working on the on the individual parts, but you're trying to put it together in some type of an outline. You try to put it together in some kind of an outline. Okay, what does this fit together? Does this fit together? What fits together? Okay, as, and then as you start trying to fit it together, now just you remember you've been starting with the whole. You've seen the whole now and you've read it five times. You've seen the entirety of it. That's why I say I I disagree. You start with the entirety of the chapter over and 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 over. Now you can break. Now you take all of that content and you break it down into those little segments. So smaller fragments, as he says, these little these little sections, then it'll all. And then once you've got that together, then you can like, okay, these sections fit in with the whole here. And this is how it does. So then you can break it down. Chief people, key verse. Crucial words, challenges, um, cross references, um, and then your central lesson or conclusion, or, or however, however you want to do that. I think you start with the whole. So here's what I would challenge you to do. Here's what I would challenge you to do. All right. Psalm 8. Just read it. I want you to read it five times if you can tonight. Just read it one of those times out loud. All right. And then just kind of write down what you think the key point is. Then, Tomorrow, for our sermons 2.0 cha- uh, our sermons 2.0 app challenge, you know what to do. Just do a search for Psalm eight. And just start grabbing sermons on Psalm eight and see what they do. Do they give you the overall understanding of the chapter? Do they break it down into individual parts? Just see how they approach it. So tomorrow, Psalm eight. That's your sermon challenge. There you go. There you go. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna make use of that. But I say start with the whole. And then move to the parts. Then you're grouping it together while you're looking at some of these other things that can be found in a chapter. Key people, key words, uh, crucial words, challenges, and cross-references. And you only want the cross-references to help you understand the chapter. Now, a lot of times we get bogged down into cross-references because we start taking the cross-references to help us understand the individual verses. And then next thing you know, we're doing a verse-by-verse of the individual verses, and we once again lose lose our focus on what the picture is on the box or what it should be on the box. When you're done with a chapter, you should be able to paint the picture on the box of what the puzzle is. There you have it. Psalm chapter eight. What do you think? Read it and give it a title. And then you can, you can, what, what, what's the key point of the Psalm? Let's try to make that a, I, I don't know, I mean, I, I, I want to turn it into something bigger, but, you know, it, it is something that we need to try to remind ourselves of, of tw- in 2024, just whenever. When you, when you leave church on Wednesday night or Sunday, now, if you had church on Sunday, do you remember? Okay, you may remember the sermon, but what was the text? What was the text of the sermon? And then right now, I want you to think, what is the key point of that chapter? What is the key point of that chapter? All right. There you go. Thanks for listening. Email me your thoughts and observations and your your perspective and your hypotheses on how to do this. And you can do that by emailing me at newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com. All right. You have a great night. I'm going to go find food. Everyone have a great night. God bless.